right, so the Hellenistic period spanned from the time of Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC and lasted until about the time of the rise of Rome in 100 BC. This was a period of a huge amount of wealth concentrated and power concentrated, and there was a large amount of trade going on around the Mediterranean. So this led to a large exchange of um, peoples, cultures, ideas all around the Mediterranean region, um, especially including Greece, Italy, and Egypt um, at this time. So during this period, Greek four mosaics, such as this one here, um, began to use tessellated tiles. So these tesserae were made up of these small cut squares of glass or stone and were used to create patterns such as this which could be um, made with tons of detail. They were able to show lots of tone, shading, um, details which mosaic had never been able to show before when they were using larger stones and pebbles in the past. and. Um, this was able to kind of mimic the accuracy that we got from painting of this time period, most likely. We don't have paintings remaining from the Hellenistic era just because of the material, it faded over time, it, um, they don't last. But mosaics do last and they give us a lot of information potentially about what painting was like at the time and especially they allow us to explore um, mosaics as its own independent medium. So. Little is known today about the process of creating these mosaics, um, how they were commissioned, how the process of making them went, um, and this is because we have very little textual information about this process. Fewer than 10 artists' names are known of mosaics of the Hellenistic world, whereas we have lots of information about um, painters and about sculptors from this time period written down. There is virtually none about mosaics. So this leaves us um, to the mosaics themselves to look for information. Um, it requires a great deal of visual analysis to see what we can discover about these mosaics. Um, for instance, looking at these two fish coming from two different mosaics from Pompeii, um, we have to look at the similarities and differences between what we see. Um, of course, we do see two very similar profile fish, uh, both facing the same direction with um, fins in the same place with similar coloring, um, similar eye configuration, stripes on their body are similar, um, and yet we also look at their differences. The coloring is different, one focuses more um, in the shape of the lips, one focuses more in the shape of the teeth. So these kind of details do give us a lot of information about these mosaics. And so although we do see a lot of evidence based on archaeological finds that a preponderance of mosaics did exist, um, there's little understanding as to who created these mosaics. So certain trends, however, have allowed us to determine that it's possible that uh, workshops were the creators of a lot of different mosaics. Um, and to determine this, we have to look at a number of different factors, such as um, whether we can see multiple individuals working on a mosaic, whether we can see trends across different mosaics. So the goal of my project was to establish whether um, workshops existed during the Hellenistic era, era um, working to create tessellated mosaics. So in order to kind of delve into this question, I had to define what I meant by a workshop. And there are a lot of different definitions, but for my purposes, I thought the best way to go about it was saying that workshops are when multiple individuals are working together to create a single um, work or a single mosaic. So these individuals would have been working together um, for long periods of time. That way we're able to see that there are trends um, that they've created and we can um, identify which workshops were um, working. And they would have likely shared materials. This makes sense because mosaics are very material heavy. Every single color that you see shown in a mosaic is made of a different material, um, whether that is glass, ceramic, stone. And so the number of relationships that these artists would have had to make um, to communicate and to gather materials from all of these different um, ceramicists, glass blowers, um, it would have taken a lot of time and it seems to make sense that in order to acquire these materials and stockpile them, it would make sense to have a workshop organization um, to make this easier and more efficient. And finally, these workshop groups would have traveled together to um, 
create their mosaics where we would have found them in modern times because um, these mosaics were made in place. They were not really created in a workshop environment and then shipped out. They were um, a permanent part of the floor. So these workshops, because of all of these different elements, they likely um, developed some stylistic similarities. They would probably have a, a specific range of compositions and recognizable trademark details that they would have been working with. Um, and those are good for us to be able to identify these workshops today. So investigating the question of mosaic workshops did require, um, so sad, a trip to Italy for me to go um, analyze some of these mosaics in person. I was able to go to um, Pompeii, Herculaneum, Palestrina um, to see a lot of these mosaics where they would have been found, and then in Naples and Rome to see many of them in uh, museums. So this trip required a lot of close looking, um, uh, and it took. It, um, I performed a lot of visual analysis while I was there to see what I could find. So the sort of thing that I was looking for, um, first of all, was to see if I could identify multiple artists' hands um, in a single mosaic. So these two fragments of mosaics come from the same mosaic found in Tel Dor in Israel, and these are two segments from a border of a larger mosaic. And you can definitely identify two different artists working on this one mosaic. So we see in the um, scene on the right, there's a pomegranate that is very well done. It is three-dimensional. Um, the reflection that you can see on this pomegranate, I guess I can point to it over here, um, blends in with the surrounding fruit. The colors fade into darker um, shades of red as you get along the exterior. Um, which provides a sense of naturalism. Um, the crown here also is very three-dimensional. It follows the same properties that we would expect from actual round objects in this world. Um, the left pomegranate is not so successful. A um, bit of a left shark thing going on here. Um, it looks as if the artist was intending to follow the rules um, based on what this artist was doing. He knew that in order to create a sense of three-dimensionality, he was supposed to have this light area in the middle, and somehow that was supposed to go into this rounded um, red section. It did not work out all that well, though, because he left his white section as a complete square. There's not really a blending of colors, and the red area around it um, is all more or less the same shade of red. And the same can be said about this crown, which is all one shade of white. Um, there is no th three-dimensionality to it all. It's very flat um, and kind of just seems to rest on top of this circular fruit, perhaps. Um, so that's a very obvious um, example of being able to identify two different people working on one mosaic. It's hard to say whether this was maybe a master and pupil working on one mosaic. Maybe it was just two different artists of different skill levels. Um, but it is clear that we can identify this. Um, it sometimes is a lot less more obvious, more often than not. So um, we get two examples such as this. These come from the Nile mosaic of Palestrina. And there are tons of different animals represented in this uh, mosaic. But among them are a series of large cat types. Uh, animals. And even here, even though these um, are not exactly the same large cat being represented, we can go through the same sort of analysis to see whether or not um, multiple hands are working here. So we have um, the same sort of attempt at um, making the light color of fur blend into the dark color to show some depth, three dimensionality. Um, here it does not work quite as well, although there is um, a better attempt than the pomegranate to make this sort of happen. And it's difficult to determine whether or not the um, differences in the faces is just due to species variation, um, if this was meant to be like this, um, or whether we could actually tell that the three-dimensionality seen in this face, um, which makes it very feline, um, we can see a lot of different cat features represented. Um, it's very different from what looks here almost like a humanoid face on a cat. It does not make so much sense. Um, it's, it's difficult to interpret this, but it definitely does not seem, um, or it seems possible that these are by different artists. 
So that's one method of determining whether workshops may have been a factor in um, creating these mosaics. And another factor is looking at multiple different mosaics and seeing whether or not um, they share commonalities. So these are two separate mosaics found in Pompeii. Um, they both have very similar scenes, as you can see. Uh, they are both scenes of aquatic life. This one, is, it takes place on top of a seascape in the background, whereas this one um, has a black background. But besides that, what you see is more or less the same. In the center of each of these scenes, we have an octopus fighting what seems to be a spiny lobster. The orientation of these creatures is pretty much the same in both of these mosaics. We have the lobster, um, his antenna are going into the same direction in both cases. The tentacles of the octopus are um, extending in all directions while also wrapping around the lobster. Um, interestingly, the eyes of both of the octopus are um, made up of concentric circles that create this kind of goggle effect. Um, and so that, that does not um, seem like it's mere coincidence. That seems like it could have been the same people creating these uh, minor details. And of course, we do have very similar coloring of the, these octopuses, um, where we have the white colored stones with the reddish brown underside of the tentacles and suckers. Um, and all of that. And so these kind of similarities extend um, into all different areas of this mosaic. We see at the top section um, of each of these scenes, there is a uh, orange with white spots uh, fish that looks kind of like a ray. Um, and there is here at the, um, at the right of each of these scenes, we have this creature that looks kind of like a fish or an eel that forms this S-shaped pattern. Um, we have, really interestingly, um, rocks at the left side of each of these mosaics, which makes sense when we have the seascape scene um, because it fits into the horizon line. But here, it definitely seems as if um, they needed something to fill that space and they were going off the same pattern. So this artist or this workshop um, included the same rocks that were over here in this image. Um, just to fill up that space. So, and of course, at the bottom, we come back to our big fish, um, which share a lot of commonalities. They're the same um, shape, the same orientation. They have these same rays radiating out from um, either each one of their eyes. Um, and we are able to kind of notice that these trends are more than just coincidental. It seems like they come from a pattern book that maybe these patrons may have been choosing the designs of their mosaics out of, which workshops were very likely using um, because it's, you know, the supply and demand, it's much easier to make these not mass produced, but um, patterned designs um, on the floors of their patrons than to have to design something completely new for every single person. So um, basically coming out of this whole process, I was able to find all of these similarities from one mosaic to the other. I was able to see trends within um, style, within the placement of the tesserae among the, or within the mosaic. I was able to find similarities in composition, in the style, um, and the technique of them being made. And um, I was also able to find the possibility of multiple hands being used in every, or in single mosaics, which definitely points to my definition of a workshop being um, multiple people working on an individual mosaic. So between these two things put together, I am definitely able to conclude that workshops were, they probably existed, <laughs> um, and they probably had a big impact in creating some of the mosaics that last for us today. So that's it. If there are any questions for the last minute. <laughs> Katie. What's just the, your favorite mosaic that you looked at? Um, Oh my gosh, I may not have had an image of it here, but there are some great, within the Nile mosaic, which these come from, there are some really great animals featured. There are some hippopotamuses. Uh, there are all sorts of great plural animals in this. Um, but they just, you know that the artist has never seen some of these animals before, and they're going based on kind of hearsay or based on um, 
I, their imagination of some of these creatures and they just look a little bit ridiculous and they're so fun to study and see what they were thinking. Thank you.